Genome BC also have a very fun workshop for you now, exploring how scientists can use genetics to trace disease outbreaks. Please welcome from Genome BC, Sally and Tatiana. Hi, welcome to Genome BC and to Gene School. My name is Sally. My name is Tatiana. And, and, <laughs> and we're super excited to be here with you folks today. And today we're actually going to talk about something really dear to our heart. And there's going to be a skills that you can actually be able to use for now on. Okay, so we are presenting an outbreak activity. So what are we doing today, Sally? I think we're going to be learning how to contact tracing. And a lot of things that we've been seeing on TV that's been presented by Dr. Henry and among many scientists that we continue to see on TV to keep us safe. Well, and basically, we're going to solve a small outbreak together. One important thing is that we really need your help to solve this outbreak, so please engage with us on the Menti platform answering our questions. And to get started, we're going to ask you the first question. What words do you associate with outbreak? And we're going to give you one minute to answer. And in the meantime, Sally, what do you feel? What do you think about when you hear outbreak? When I hear the word outbreak as a scientist, there's a lot of things that come to my mind. But as in my everyday life, I think about the outbreak that happens under beneath my mask as we wear to continue to protect ourselves and everyone else <laughs> around us. You know what I want to know? Your skincare routine. <laughs> my skincare routine I will share to you after this activity. <laughs> and I do, I definitely can relate to what you feel about when you hear outbreak. I personally was thinking about zombie apocalypse movie, oh but we God. actually have some good answers from our participants here. I like acne, so yeah. people can relate to us for sure. Yes. I see chaos. Um, life mm -hmm. got pretty chaotic uh, with this outbreak. Um, what are your favorite answers here? I Let's really, give it a couple more seconds. I really like the certain vocabulary, such as like viral. Um, I like the word disease, uncontained. Oh, I, so many of these vocabulary comes to mind. And the word scary, I think we can all relate, but yet we have been able to adapt these words to things like wearing a mask, getting our vaccines. I love how everybody has already been able to notice that too. Yeah, and one thing that I really like here, oh, I see the zombie, yes. that's great. <laughs> and I also like germs because of course, right now we all think of outbreaks as being caused by viruses, but of course, not only viruses can cause an outbreak. Anyway, speaking about the outbreak we all live in right now, Sally, does this image look familiar to you? What is going on here? I think a lot of us have been seeing this on TV as well in our everyday life. And it looks like quite confusing, but I believe it isn't. So I'm pretty sure you're <laughs> gonna start walking us through. Can you talk, tell our participant, how can we read this and how can we translate this right, so we'll be I'm able here. to use it in our everyday life? That is exactly what I'd like to do. So a few things, of course, this is a screenshot from a briefing uh, as of June 4th, 2020. And a few things we want to highlight here. Number one is the term genomic epidemiology. So do you think it is something that everybody is familiar with? Like if we go out on the street and ask, people are going to know? No, I think the word, these vocabularies such as Thanks. genomics is very new to many of our audience here. Um, I think a lot of us, we understand the word DNA that's and even true. the term RNA has been very new to a lot of people mm -hmm. that haven't been able to be exposed to a lot of science. So what exactly when we talk about epidemiology? Even this word is such a I know, this for is me. not as straightforward yeah. as we'd like it to be. So here you go. Genomic is coming from genes, of course. So it is something based on DNA or RNA. And epidemiology is basically figuring out where is the virus coming from? Are they similar to each other? Are they different? Did they mutate? And most importantly, are they of concern? Now, looking at this graph right here, this is a very useful thing in genomic epidemiology and contact tracing. So each dot here is a virus that was sequenced. So basically their genomic information was decoded. And reading this map from left to right, we are moving from past to present. So we can see that the first virus in BC was probably this dot, and you can see what the name of this virus was. And we can see that as of June 4th, 2020, the most prevalent virus was the one labeled pink. So basically, of course, to draw such tree, we need to sequence the viruses. But these trees are used for monitoring the variants, because we hear about variants all the time, mm -hmm. and also for contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense so far? Yeah, and is the word variant same as strains? Yeah. 
Well, variant strains, we can use them interchangeably. And of course, all these branches that you see, in mm -hmm. case you were wondering, they are pointing out to different mutations or changes, but we will talk about that uh, further. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's just sum this up together and with our participants. So we have the next question for you all. So what questions can genomic epidemiology answer? Um, and while we are waiting for the answers from our participants, do you think there is anything genomic epidemiology can't do? I think there's a lot of things we can do. I actually can do, cannot think of anything we cannot do. Genomics has been such a powerful tool, like even like, for example, computer coding. I think genomics mm -hmm. is very much like computer coding, but within our body. It has only four letters, but it's such a powerful tool to help us explain so many things that happens within ourselves, animals, and anything living, to be honest. That's very true. Also, if we think about current season, for example, current time, genomic epidemiology is a science that can help us figure out what flu strains we need in our, in our flu shots. Hopefully, everybody is getting their flu shots. Uh, this would also be thankful thankfully to genomic epidemiology. Uh, look at those answers coming in. Let's give it a few seconds, but just looking at the trends, looks, looks like we have a split. Mm -hmm. There is an answer that is the least popular, uh, how viruses cause the disease, and this tells me that our participants are doing really, really well yeah. here. It's probably one of the answers I didn't think many people would choose, but I think it's very true, how viruses cause disease. By understanding this, we can understand how we can find ways to uh, perhaps even cure or treat the uh, form of treatments to help our, uh, our patients that yeah. are sick. For example, for example, the COVID-19. Yeah. Well, but wrapping this up, basically the answer number four, how viruses cause the disease, would probably be for infectious diseases mm -hmm. and virology. But the first three answers our participants are getting right. So where the viruses are coming from, who is transmitting the virus, and which strains of the virus are present. So it looks like we are on track, and we yes. know that if we get a virus from somebody, we can build this tree and do the contact yes. tracing. But Sally, what happens in between? What happens behind the uh, scenes? There are so many things behind the scenes that we don't talk about. We, we understand what our strains and mutation is, but to understand, figure this out, we actually have to go through a series of things. For example, we know that if we go through testing, we get, for example, right now, we are very commonly known maybe a gargle and use as a nose swab. But those samples that we collect, we actually put it in a DNA sequencer, and then that will give us the codes that help us read. And this was only four letters, and it has so much diversity within that. But to form a tree and look at mutation, can you explain more of that in detail for us? Yeah, absolutely. So you are right. We use the sequencer, and I liked what you mentioned about the four letters because basically genomic code is easier to read than English language because, well, it's just four letters, right? So you can see here we have those viruses that are labeled with different colors, and each color sequenced is each color is mm -hmm. basically sequenced here. So we have four viruses, blue one, purple one, red one, and pink one. And what's happening is that, well, apparently the blue one was first. You see only four letters. In the purple one, we have this one little letter change. So we have T changed for A. In the red one, C is changed for G, another one letter change. And in this picture here, we can see that, you know, there is this little branching point. We call it well, we call it a branching point, which <laughs> identifies a mutation, and we see two parallel viruses here. Yeah. And as we move forward, the pink one has one more additional change. This is why uh, the pink one would be the last stemming from red. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense so far? It very much makes sense. But I do have one thing I have in mind that could you tell our audience and our participants, how come this isn't called a family tree, but a file phonetic tree? Well because we're not talking about your family and about your parents, but yes. we're talking about the origin of species. Mm -hmm. So we are in the scientific talk, so we're gonna use the scientific term for this, which is the phylogenetic tree. Yes. Anyway, we showed you a little way about how to build a small tree based on these viruses. And just to make sure that we are all on the same page, we have the next question for you. So this is basically what we talked about already. Uh, which viral particle is the most distant genetic relation to the blue virus. Mm -hmm. um, so while you're voting, we can just discuss the, very, the brief conclusion about how we analyze those trees. You know what I really think is, um, comes to my mind when I think of distant genetics? It's kind of like looking like, as I mentioned earlier, a family tree. 
it has a similarity of like who is our distant relative. Mm -hmm. In some senses, it's like distant genetics. Has it similar but yet different in some of their own unique way. That's very true. Yes. And also you can, you know, like somebody who's on the left side, we can call an ancestor. Yeah. Just like in your family. And whoever is on the right side is someone who's like currently living. Mm -hmm. So in your family tree, like that would probably be you yeah. or me, the pink virus. So, um, yeah, really curious uh, what our participants think about which viral particle is the most distant. Do we want to have a look? Wow. Oh, my God. I think they have aced it, this um, question. And I think what also comes to our mind is that when we, when we have been doing these questions, discussing a different scientific method, it com just comes to our minds that a lot of these things are connected in so many ways. That is correct. Do you think our questions are a little too easy for our participants? Should we just make it a little more difficult? I think we have to give them a little challenge to help see if they're actually really listing and actually <laughs> acing this as it goes. I'm ready to make this happen. So for everyone, we have one more phylogenetic tree. And now we know that we are calling it phylogenetic tree, not the family tree. Yes. Uh, what are we wondering about in this case, Sally? Um, I thought we we're trying to figure out who's our closest relatives to humans. Well, that would be a very simple answer. <laughs> but to make it really more difficult for our participant, who is the closest relative to primates? Um, and the options are birds, amphibians, fish. And, you know, there are other things in the picture, but we are wondering between birds, amphibians, and fish. So I agree. If the human was here, that would be probably very simple to figure out. That is true. I would true. pick human right away. I think it's true, too. I think it's one of the coolest things to think about who are our ancestors uh, who, like, who are similar to us, yet so different now these days. It's kind of weird. We don't even speak the same language. And most of these animals are actually very much related in some form, but they don't even like, have similar feature. It's just simply within their genetics. We know they come from someone that's of a same ancestor or similar ancestors. Isn't this interesting that all the species, all the evolution is basically one gigantic yeah. phylogenetic tree? That's true. That'd be really cool to see if we can be able to connect every living thing on Earth in one tree, just through genetics. I bet somebody's doing that. Oh, I bet somebody did maybe that. Maybe it's one of our participants. Maybe it's yeah. one of our participants. If you are, let us know. <laughs> Please do contact yes. us if you figured that out. But um, let's have a look at those answers. So we see some... You know what, I think it's like a tricky question, but our participants are doing really, really mm -hmm. well. So the most popular answer so far is birds. Do you agree with that? Do you think that's the, that's the correct answer? I think, mm. You like it? I like it, but I'm actually <laughs> a little confused. Should we, should we explain this a little more? Yes, please. Yeah, because I mean, I don't want to offend amphibians, but um, birds is the right answer. And now we're gonna explain why. So as we mentioned, mm -hmm. In looking at phylogenetics tree, we move from right to left, which means that we move back in time. So what we want to find, essentially, is the branching point. And the branching point we call the, the most recent common ancestor, right? So if you go from chimpanzee right here, mm -hmm. and where is the amphibian? That is always confusing for me, honestly, but I think it's the salamander. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, that's so. my first thought as well, too. Yeah. If we go back from salamander and just like travel back in time, trying to find where mm -hmm. it branches with um, primates, it would probably be um, right here. You're wondering why I skipped birds. I don't know. Let's look at the birds. So pigeon is definitely a bird. Mm -hmm. And if we follow it back in time, the branching point would be here. The branching point with amphibians following back in time would be right here. Mm -hmm. And with uh, fish, going back in time would be right there. So we know the more left the branching, the branching point is, the further in the past it is. Mm -hmm. So of course, the most recent ancestor uh, would be bird. Does it's not that sense? difficult after all. Not so difficult after nope. all. Let's look at the updated answers. Looks like it's not so difficult after all. I think our participants are acing this. They're, our, they might just become geneticists in the future and work with us. That is our goal essentially today. Yep. Right? That is our goal. Uh, well, I feel like we are ready for some real world uh, phylogenetic trees. So here we go, <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 virus. And um, if you look at this tree and think about the first tree from Bonnie Henry's video that we saw, mm -hmm. what are the biggest differences that strike you? Well, first of all, we saw that back in June 2020, the most dominant was on our tree was the pink dots. Mm -hmm. But it looked like it has a lot more mutation. And the dominant strain here, or also variant, has become green. And 
if we see the news nowadays, we always speak about Delta variant. Yep. So that hasn't, June 2020, that might have been, um, still could have been Beta Alpha, and that now that has changed. I know that you wanted earlier mention some of the names and how we name these different strains. Yeah, this is one of my favorite points. Uh, of course, early in the pandemic, we were doing a lot of things for the first time ever. And one of the earlier practices was to name viruses based on the city of origin. But of course, we all understand that this is irrelevant and might be actually damaging and stigmatizing. So there is no need for any of that. And right now, the science uses this generic name such as alpha, beta, delta. And that is what we see right now. So on this map, um, as of September 2021, and I believe this is still relevant for us, the biggest amount of dots are green. That's the Delta variant. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure everybody heard about it. And this is the most common variant as of now. Mm -hmm. But of course, if we move back in time, we can see that another colors were more dominant. But what is really important, two things actually. Number one is that our participants can go to nextstrain.org and explore these maps by themselves. But number two is how does this data even get on the website? Yeah, so this is something we're definitely going to be talking about and dive into a little. And definitely this is something perhaps you can look into later on after our workshop. So we dive in. I think we have an outbreak that we need our participant to help us today. Is that I true? Agree. I agree. Let's address more important issues first. <laughs> so the most important issue as of now for, for us is this outbreak that happened, guess where, in Vancouver. And oh. Ashley got some respiratory symptoms. So when, so it looks like we have been very closely related, uh, closely in contact with Ashley. She's one of our members on our Gene School team. Yeah. So we need our help, your help to see what happened and how did Ashley got in contact and how, where this virus strain came from. So what do you think? Well, I think that, of course, getting respiratory symptoms right now is a little more concerning mm -hmm. than getting them like a few years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So this is exactly why we're going to use genomic epidemiology to figure this out. We also know that, of course, uh, genomic epidemiology cares a lot about community. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have all these other names here. So these are Ashley's friends that she met a few days prior uh, her symptoms onset. So we also got some samples from her friends so that after we sequence them and figure out what virus this is, we can contact them in, yeah. case, in case we need this. Uh, well, so from our previous slide, we know already that we need to do this whole sequencing thing. Mm -hmm. Somebody did this for us because there are a lot of amazing people working at Genome BC. And now you're gonna see this little, you know, looks like a bunch of letters, honestly, but we already discussed this all <laughs> genetic. Only four letters. <laughs> only four letters. So all of us are just four letters. So just accept this fact, please. But all the viruses from the people were sequenced. And of course, if you have multiple viruses, you can start asking all those questions, right? Are they having the same virus? Are these viruses dangerous? Should we inform public health about it? Should they self-isolate? Mm -hmm. All these things. So let's just start writing the job here. This is a very, our favorite website. Yes. And we're gonna talk about it while the job is running. <gasps> is it on DNA? Did you remember change it this time? I did. Oh, good job. I don't make this mistake anymore. <laughs> but while the, while the job is running, um, what do you like about this website? Because we use it a lot in our work. It has so many information and some, it could be so overwhelming at first, but it does do simplify a lot of things for easy for us to translate or review the data, just like how right now. Oh my God, so fast. Like there are so many data here. We have, we have result summary, guide tree, but the one we really care a lot and to know how everything's work or whether or not um, any of the friends caught the same strain or they have changed or they're different strain of different viruses or the same strain of virus is the file net from that tree. And that's very important to a lot of us, especially if we're trying to contact trace. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at this phylogenetic tree produced from the samples we got from Ashley and her friends. Mm -hmm. And we saw our participants figuring out previous phylogenetic yeah. trees. So I have a lot of faith that they'll be able to do this once again. Yes. So Ashley, our participant of interest is right here. And two things before we dive into questions and deciphering this information. First one, you can see the name of the viruses, so you mm -hmm. can figure out for yourself whether it's, you know, very concerning, just concerning, or, um, and also you can see that uh, the people are clustered, yeah. right? Like not everyone has the same virus. Yeah. So that is something to keep in mind. But there are a lot of things that is taught in within this file of trees shows that whether they're similar or not. 
and we can actually look at that. And But we're going to let our participant help us figure out some information before we dive in to look at it a little bit in more detail. For sure. So let's just ensure that we are all on the same page and ask some questions. So, of course, because Ashley contacted us first, yes. she's our patient zero, sort yeah. of. So the question is about her. So where was Ashley? Who was she with when she was first exposed to virus? And of course, we showed you the picture for yeah. a brief time. So here it is once again. You can see how people are clustered right here. And um, this image might actually help you mm -hmm. uh, answer this question. So who was Ashley with? Ashley is right here once again when she was exposed to the virus. And while people are answering, um, let's just maybe remind once again how, how we read these trees. Like what is one thing to remember? Well, let's remember that the further left you are, mm -hmm. um, the more distant you are from, the, uh, from that person. Okay. And then the closer you are towards the right, um, the most closely related you are. So, but there's one thing that's good. You and I are not on the list. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Contact, yes. this is why, this is contact tracing is very this is important. The, that is why. But, um, and those branches, branches are important. What are, mm -hmm. what are these branches? What, is, what do they mean? So at the branching point, we know these are mutation. Changes in, could be one letter or two mm -hmm. letter. And even with one letter change within your genomics, that is still a mutation. And there's so many different kind of mutation that can change it drastically to be a different strain of virus mm -hmm. or just still the same virus, but just a little different. Could be more severely sick of some form or could be a whole different tree of its own later on. Definitely. Yeah. One simple way to think about it is thinking of a typo. Sometimes you just accidentally make mm -hmm. a typo in your word, but it's still the same word, you can tell. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's like completely different meaning. So of course, from here, from this graph, we cannot tell whether the mutation is meaningful yeah. or just, you know, just one letter change. But, you know, let's start simple. Let's start mm -hmm. simple. So let's look at the answers. Um, so we see that Shannon and Alexis Ooh. are the most common answers. Yeah. I like that. I like that Clark, Kelly, and Fiona are out of the mm -hmm. picture. Yep. We like that. That's process elimination. And I think the fact that Clark and Kelly and Fiona is out of the picture, I think that our participants understand that they are very distant and that they suffer from a different type of illness. And that Shannon and Ash Alexis actually have similar uh, illness uh, to Ashley as well. If you look back at the tree, which one is actually the correct answer? Well, the correct answer is going to be revealed later on because oh. we have one more question right here. So who else received the same strain of virus as mm -hmm. Alexis? I feel like our participants already figured that we have a cluster sort of yes, thing here. Yes, yes. Yeah. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, one more question. Who else received the same strain of virus as Alexis? And in the meantime, uh, would you do you think these viruses are, are dangerous? Do you think we would... You know, like, what would be the report steps here? Like, would the public health be contacted? Mm -hmm. Like, how do, you, how do you feel about so, that? So I think that we don't really know how severe it is, definitely. I don't really think a genomic can really be able to tell us that. We act, there's so many more steps to, through science to be able to do this. I think we have to contact the doctors, to For the sure. our frontline workers, and ask them how sick are the patients they have noticed, and how has um, public health has to be contact and be able to contact trace that. So there's a lot of, takes a lot of big, a lot of people within a team, uh, within the science community to help a lot of the people, just like our pandemic at this very, at this very moment. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of people are responsible for their parts mm -hmm. of work. And of course, people who are experts in the uh, transmission rates and details about those different BA viruses, of course, we would contact them to figure mm -hmm. out, that out. But looking at the answers, do we like them? Love it. Love it. Shannon is the answer, mm -hmm. and we definitely love that answer. Mm -hmm. Some people answered nobody else. And just to clarify, we're just going to walk you through like the, the explanation of this map, basically. So briefly, Ashley, our patient zero, is right here. Yeah. And today, we're going to move from present to past. Mm -hmm. So we see that the closest to her virus is Shannon's virus. Yes. So it looks like they are very close, have some slight differences, mm -hmm. but probably very close, like if not the same strain. As we move back, we see this branching point, yes. and we know that branching point is a form mutation. Is a mutation. So there is a branching point which leads us to Alexis. Mm -hmm. And if we move once again a little back, we come to polythoracic virus B. Yes. So it looks like this this virus was out there 
in the nature and then Alexis somehow got it mm -hmm. and then it was out there once again and then somehow Ashley and Shannon got it as yeah, well. Yeah, it looks like Fiona and Kelly, uh, Clark and Kelly have similar if not different and Fiona also has a different rise too. So yeah. this tells us so many information that we don't know to everyday life, but we do know who has which virus. And I think genomics, that's how it, how it's very important, especially with the colder season coming. We know there's influenza and there's COVID-19. And this is exactly what we do every day to be able to differentiate them. This is exactly what a lot of people do every day to save the world. Yes. <laughs> Stop pandemics. Anyway, we have all this data and we mentioned that, you know, this data is useful. We want to put it to good use. So we will ask our participants, what would you do next yeah. with all this data? And while we are waiting for the answers, what would you do next? Oh, I'll definitely be calling everyone in the community. Okay, what would you tell them? Well, I got to tell them that exactly who has been in contact, who's mm -hmm. sick, what kind of strain of viruses, mm -hmm and what else we received in data and confirmed that Clark, Kelly, and Fiona actually have something different. Yes, contact tracing is very important mm -hmm. in the global effort to, to save the world, I think you can say. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with mm -hmm. this data. One thing is definitely reaching to the community via public health, healthcare professionals. One more thing is actually what I would do. Do you know what I would do? I know exactly what you do. What would I do? You're going <laughs> to add all these data to what's it called again? Next strain. Oh, Next yes. Strain. Yes, I would definitely. So one cool thing about genomic epidemiology is that the concept of being open. So <laughs> all the scientists in the world need to work together to solve the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whenever somebody sequences a virus, uh, a lot of people share the data on the next string website or in other places. And that is how we know. Um, this is where the dots are coming from, first of all. And this mm -hmm. is how we know about the variants. Um, okay, we have some answers coming in. So I do am we want in to... love with the answers at, at, um, at all times. And I love how our participants at home are uh, listening to our public health because you know how we know you're listening to public health? You're telling people to stay home if they're sick so they won't be able to spread um, the illness that they're experiencing. And I think that's very good. I love mm -hmm. that the majority of answers is focusing on the community yeah. importance because yeah. certain things we have to do not only for ourselves, but also for our communities. Yes. I see a lot of self-isolation, mm -hmm. quarantine, um, uh, make sure that everybody knows the truth. Yes. We love truth. Yes. Uh, isolate, mm -hmm. wear masks, social distance. Uh, oh, I love that answer. Stay home and wash your hands frequently. Washing your hands was one of my favorite points that someone made earlier too. Yes, that's very important. And I think that it just shows and demonstrates that a lot of people at home and even in public health, uh, whoever watches Dr. Henry mm -hmm. every day, we know that you know to stay home when you're sick, but I think that point that Tatiana made earlier as scientists and people in the field of STEM, it's important that we share these scientific um, findings to all the community because as a global community, when we share our data, we are able to figure out what is the mutation, what are transmission rate, what are the mutation rate. And I still remember a participant earlier mentioned that by sharing these data, we can figure out what are the next steps to finding a vaccine that's better, um, what are the next steps for treatment, that is amazing. That's exactly what's happening in our everyday life. And that knowing that young participants at home understand this, you are definitely giving us a bright future and hope. I honestly love this answer so much. Like, take care of yourself, mm -hmm. wear a mask, get tested. Mm -hmm. A lot of mentioning of community. I know I said this already, but I yes. think this is so important that people are thinking about others. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, wear a mask. So please wash your hands. If you wash your hands a lot, please moisturize your hands after, right? And then wear your mask at all times. So thank you. Thank you all for all your answers. This has been fantastic. We have one of the last questions here. We've been wondering all this time, how, how did we do today? Mm -hmm. I think did we're going to give everyone a couple seconds. Yeah. Because I think everyone might be still a little confused with our activity or maybe they have questions that they want to ask us as what we do in our everyday life. That's true. Yeah. So a few things you can do, uh, of course, you can let us know how we did today because, you know, one more thing that can happen is us selling myself, coming to your class, delivering yes. some other workshops. So, you know, just let us know. Let your teachers know about Genome VC and <laughs> this will help. School. Genome VC Gene School. But yeah, check out Genome VC. They do a partner. lot of things too. 
Yeah. And if you want to ask us questions, you can do so as well. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ask us anything you like. And just keep in mind that we are volunteers at Jean School. And we do, we do do a lot of things outside of volunteering as well. But yeah, you might just see us in your classroom in the future too. Usually it is Tatiana and I these days. Usually these days, we are always wearing our masks, washing our hands, yes. and talking about viruses. Yeah, and if you, if, you don't, if you haven't been able to ask us the question you like, I'm pretty sure you can contact Science World or Genome BC at Gene School. Contact everyone. Yep. So if you have any question, Let please us know. Let us know. <gasps> is yeah. your job fun? <laughs> <laughs> is your job fun? <laughs> of course. What do you do? I think one of the best thing about working in STEM is that there's endless problems to solve and being curious about everything. And whenever you're curious about anything, everything we learn about the basic, whether it comes to observation, making hypotheses and all that, is applied to an everyday life. And yeah, I, I personally work with a lot of COVID screening and logistic and that. So what about you? Sounds like fun. Well, I work in the lab and I like that. I like handling viruses. I like <laughs> sinning maybe when I do so. So yes, I will answer this as fun. Uh, why did you decide to work where you do? I think mostly because of curiosity and the fact that I really like to help the community and being able to interact with people. Uh, well, let's mark this as answered and I'm gonna take the next one. How long have you been volunteering? That is a good question. The one more question would be also for how long do you plan to volunteer more? <laughs> Forever for me and Sally? Yes, too. definitely. Just invite us to the class. Yes. Anyway, so many amazing questions. We are looking forward to um, seeing you guys once again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your amazing engagement.